that he will speak only your words, and that it will be a blessing to all of us. Lord, bring your spirit down upon us that we may experience you and grow in you. Amen. Now it's on. Hey, look at that. Awesome. That's embarrassing for my first time. So I'll just say it again. Happy Sabbath. Thank you for coming. Thank you for taking time out of your lives to be here. <laughs> who understands what that means? Collectively, who understands what all of it means? You think you have an idea? I saw your hand. What do you think it means? Come on, Daniel. <laughs> Come on. Uh, it's like it's about movements of working together. Wow. You want to preach this, man? You got it. Yeah. Like, you, you can do it. I'm sweating and my voice hurts. And next. next time. Next week, then, because I'm here again next week. This is a reference that nobody thought I'd be able to do, and I'm doing it because God's like, it'll work. I promise it'll work. And I'm really hoping that they're watching right now for it to actually work properly. I'm going to start off with a little bit of scripture. One thing that we didn't do today was read scripture, but I wanted to tie it in directly to the sermon, so forgive me for not having a scripture reading earlier. We normally do. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. If you want, there's Bibles in front of you. I didn't put it on the slide or you can pull out a smart device, or you can scroll it either way. I'm going to be reading it. God's people say amen when you got it. Amen. All right. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our worship meetings, as so habitually do, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I have another little one. You don't have to go find it. It's Proverbs 27, 17. Is anybody familiar with that off the top of their head? Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. It's taken me a long time to get to this point, to be able to stand in front of people here at the seminary. And I was, at the beginning, had no clue what to talk about. Starting a service, no, I'll let the SSF president speak. No, I'll let the religious undergrad speak because there are people that actually do stuff here in the seminary. I've been here for four years. Wow. Wow, four years. And uh, I haven't been part of any of the SSF stuff. I haven't been part of BSAS. I haven't been part of anything. I've been doing low-key stuff in Chicago. And I was thinking, how do I stand before the seminarians? How do I stand before people that have spent the majority of their life getting to know God, getting to open the Bible, and digging deeper for that truth. <clears throat> for those that come next week, you will learn I was not a Christian up until recently because of that girl over there and her family it was there and there. Um, I don't want anything to do with God. So what biblical truths do I have to give to the saints of the seminary? It's pretty nerve-wracking. I've been mulling it over in my head all week. What am I going to do? What am I going to talk about? Come on, God, hook a brother up. What you got? I need help. Keith, can you get this to stop rotating? And then it hit me. Who am I? Most people don't know who I am. Most people don't come over to my place. Most people don't visit. You lived in my building, and you came over one time for a group project. I can see the smile on your face. I'm not a lifer of the church. I'm not a lifer of God. I know very little of the Bible. Well, the one thing I do know is video games. And for those of you who have been to my apartment, what is alphabetized, neatly stacked, and organized along my wall? 
my video games. What is thrown on the bookshelf that is in no particular order with pages bent and some of the books not even open? My books. Whoops, there's money down the drain, I guess. It's what I do in my free time, it's how I relax. It's how I get away when I'm so stressed out with family issues, with going to the gym, with everything in my life that is driving me crazy. It's what I do to relax. Some people have a hard time with that idea. Many people have told me I need to stop playing games. No, you need to quit, quit playing video games. By beholding, you become. That might be it for you. For me, though, I see God in everything. He is everywhere around us. He is in everything, and we can use all these wonderful tools like this. There's a sermon on here that I'm preaching to you guys. Was that the intent of this? No, it wasn't. It's so people could leave mean comments on YouTube to each other. But there's now a message from God on here. Yeah, you guys need to fix that. I played Grand Theft Auto. I play Assassin's Creed, which I kind of feel like is Adventist 101 because you're going around after Catholics. And I, <laughs> if anyone can tell me that I'm lying, please go ahead, because I missed what all that time was spent doing. And I play God of War. Oh, that one's not so funny. You're playing a god, you're killing other gods very violently. That was one of the first games that ever made me cringe, by the way. Oh, that was, that was a violent game. Yeah, that was a violent game. And so there's another video game that I play, and it's an online game, and anybody ever hear of like World of Warcraft? It's like that, but better. <laughs> it's in a biased opinion, it's better. And I was talking with my guildmates because I pay for an online server. They don't think I'm a pastor. They're like, you play video games, you have a motorcycle, you run your mouth off like the rest of us do. No. No, 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 you, we don't believe you're a pastor. And that was the big rush to get this all set up to do online streaming because they wanted to watch me preach a sermon about this. And I'm like, I can do it. And I can do it because God's with me to do it. Pray with me real quick. I hope we're not praying too much because I don't ever think you can pray too much. So here's the door if you think we are. Father God, thank you for getting me through the opening songs because my voice is killing me. Father, thank you so much for whatever it is I'm about to say. Lord, I ask that you look past my sins and mistakes, shine through me brightly, deliver whatever message you have to give to your people. I beg you, do not let me get in the way of this. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray, Lord. Amen. How many converts are in the room? Converts people that aren't, weren't born in the Adventist church or who were born in the Adventist church, went away, and then came back. Throw your hand up if you're proud. I'm proud. You can throw your hand up. We've had this conversation. There we go. See, even the people on stage are converts. It's okay. Or not Adventism. Who, who went away from the church and came back, I should say, because technically it's non-denominational right now. What background do you come from? Who, who came away? You raised your hand, right? Do you want to share where you, what you just did beforehand? Okay. You raised your hand. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Can't beat that. You, Daniel. Oh. You raised your hand. I just, I was converted, so you know, I guess I was. Just not here. I was an Adventist convert. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Keith, you rediscovered faith, kind of on your own, with that conversation you had. You, you made it your own thing, right? Yeah. In my background, I was a video game designer. How cool is that? Think Pixar, think all those 3D movies, I know how to do that. And that's what I wanted to do with my life. Because those changed a lot of lives. I can remember the moment it was in fifth grade, I was at my buddy Garrett's house, we were upstairs, and I started playing this game called Final Fantasy VII. And that blew, <laughs> blew my mind away with the amount of story and persuasion and power storytelling has. And I thought, I'm doing it through games. That's how I want to change the world. I don't know what I'm going to change the world to do, but that's how I'm going to change the world. 
Now I'm in the seminary. Come back next week, you'll find out why. Why did you choose this church? Do you want to share that one? Nope, too early, guys. Go back. So you just followed your, your mom and you kind of discovered God? Is that what you said? But you stayed. That's the important part is you stayed. I'm going to get to why we stay in a minute. Were you Adventist before or did you come to it? Okay. Me too. No, I wasn't raised Adventist. Daniel, I know you were raised Adventist. I know you were raised Adventist. Why did you stay in the Adventist church? That's my question. That's my question. Every morning I wake up to have to go to school. Why did I stay in this church? Oh, I hate mornings. Why did you stay? Every religion, everything has a problem in it. We all know that. We're struggling with, what, women's ordination, regional conferences, the unity of everything. And I say, why do I stay here? What's the point? God hasn't answered it yet, but that tuition bill keeps asking me why, too. Was it the food? I didn't find out until later, Advents have a very big health message. If they would have come at me with that first, I wouldn't have stayed. <laughs> I'm a guy who likes to eat, and you can tell by looking at me, I likes me my food. Was it the deep theology? That's what hooked me. The, the, the way at which the Bible was approached. I like this. I can get in on this. This, this makes sense. All well, the other rules don't, but that made sense. Was it the history of the movement? I went on the Adventist Heritage Tour. Wow, that was amazing. Seeing where they came from, what they were doing, why they were doing it, just the passion these people had. If I turn my back to you guys, I apologize. I'm practicing a new setup called In the Round for preaching, which is why they're still sitting behind me. And it's to kind of create this small group feeling, which is weird because you guys are like four or five rows back. So if I turn around, sorry. And I talked to you about it, Keith. It was the way that... Anybody play Oregon Trail? I finally came up with a religious video game, Adventist Heritage through Oregon Trail. See, and that smile on your face, Daniel, tells me I'm on the right way because a lot of other people like that idea too. You know, one reason I stayed was because of the people, because of these people. The three people in this room that have known me the longest are probably one of the biggest reasons I'm here in this church today. Kim, Daniel, and Kyler. Just the unconditional love and affection and awesomeness and friendship and disc golfing and two in the morning calls of why I hate my life and soothing and comforting. These people are the reason, the reason I'm here in this church still. When I originally decided to want to become an Adventist, I thought, man, there's going to be so many things I'm going to give up. Right, Keith? There's so many rules. There's so many, man, you can't go to movie theaters. You can't eat meat. You can't eat animal byproduct. You can't, you can't do this stuff. I'm not kidding. That's all I'd heard of. Can't, 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 can't. Okay. However, if that's what I need to do to go to Jesus, to be one with who Jesus is, I'll do it. I'll do it. Oh, man. Bacon is so good. If you guys are vegetarians, you have no idea what you're missing out. Bacon is fantastic. That little fake bacon you guys have, no. It is not that good. Bacon is fantastic. Here you go, Jesus. I'll do it for you. This is what I have to do. I don't have to go to the movie theaters anymore? Well, I guess I'll be saving 10 bucks a week. That's true. Okay, there you go, Jesus. Like, there were just a lot of things I couldn't do from my limited understanding of what this was. When I met the people in my, my home church in Hinsdale, Illinois, that perspective quickly changed. Oh, there's conservatives. Oh, there's liberals. Oh, there's psychos. Oh, there's the end of the world prophesiers. Sweet. No, no. Yeah, you guys are cool. You're open and easygoing. How do we change the people around us? How do we change things around us? I'll open that up for a minute. How do we change people around us? Just raise your hand if you have an answer. I'm in a school full of master's degree students and no one has an answer. Daniel, run it. Uh -huh. you, you gotta show it to show that it works, otherwise they believe in it. 
Fantastic. Anybody else? Go ahead. Come on, guys. Stay on that. Say it again. OK. Anyone else have an idea, suggestion? Band members? How do we change people? Be with them. You have two in the back. Run it. Go for it. I can't hear you. There you go. Anybody have any friends who are hardcore smokers? Do you preach to them not to, or do you just be with them? I knew smoking was bad. I smoked for five or six years. My church friends never said a word to me about it. They would ride in my car, and I'd smoke, and never said a word to me about it. But I stopped, eventually, randomly. How long can I go without doing this? God carried me through it, so now I don't smoke anymore. What role do you play in changing other people? How do you get them to grow, and how do you nurture their lives? Moving on, did you know that there's a, there's a, there's a statistic out there? Who is taking church growth and equipping pastors? Don't seem too excited. Who'd you take it with? Who? Oof. Never mind. <laughs> um, there's a statistic out there that I learned in that class, and it kind of made me like, what? That is so not, that's actually 100% accurate. For a new person to come into the church, any church, and stay there, they need seven immediate other contacts in their life. Anybody hear that before? Anybody not hear that before? And it got me thinking a little bit. Seven other, that's a lot of people. Seven other people. And there was Nick, there was Becca, there was Bonnie, there was Steve, there was Mel, there, were, there was Bob. There, oh man, I hit seven people. And it's true. Seven people immediately need to be there, be there for them, easy to reach them, and be their friend. Be their friend. Don't preach to them. Don't hammer theology at them. Just be there for them. And it works. I started thinking about those seven people. If one of them was too much alike another person, I was out. I have a... I have a guy who's very, very heavy Bible, and he just talks Bible and references Bible. I can deal with that because that's him. There's another one, I'm gone. They needed to be an individual person, not the hive mind concept of church and Christianity and everything we do for everything together because everything is awesome. The seven other people, though, needed to have a common goal of what they were believing and where they wanted to be in their life. So I can't have Ben be a friend of mine who wants to go out to the bars drinking and playing my band, while Keith wants to go to church and do a prayer group, and while Kyler wants to go paintballing and skydiving, and why Lindsay just doesn't want to hang out with me because she hates me. they got to have a common goal to get us going forward. These other people had to be friendly and they had to be welcoming. That's a given, right? If you want to make friends with people, you need to be welcoming to people. Brian, you feel me? No? Go take some pictures, buddy. And then it hit me of what I need to talk about. That's what I play. It was Final Fantasy XIV, A Realm Reborn. A game that initially was so bad, it was one of the worst games of all time, redesigned and relaunched. And it's the online game that I'm talking about. Like I mentioned, I do play video games. I've played MMOs, Warcraft, Star Trek, Armada, oh jeez, League of Legends, Guild Wars, <laughs> yeah, Guild Wars, whoops, forgot about that one. Um, Final Fantasy IV. Mm, yeah, there's probably about six or seven other ones that are still closed to testing. And this is the one I'm playing. It's got amazing graphics, a beautiful storyline. I would suggest if you want to lose your life, go ahead and lose it to this. It's okay. We can talk about it. 
I'll bring theology and Bible into it for you. One thing I found absolutely amazing about this game as I kept playing it is when you reach the end of it, is there's a party system in this game. And this party system is comprised of eight people. And you do dungeon runs, you kill monsters together, you save the world together. You keep doing all these things together in a group. And it's, and it's, and it's eight people in the immediate group. And, and that started sticking with me. Eight people, eight people, eight people. Me plus seven people. Okay. Numbers are starting to add up here. They're funny. They're smart. Some of them are smart. Not all of them are smart. My, I, speaking as a character, depend on them to stay alive. And when I talk with them, and when we get together, it reminded me of how my small group got together for church and started interacting with each other. Right now, I am in what is called a free company. It is a guild. And we are called the Genova's Witness. And the recruiting story of that was, I kept reading on my screen, and I thought it said Jehovah's Witness, Jehovah's Witness. And I'm like, there's no way they're trying to do a Jehovah's Witness group of people in this game. And I asked them, I said, do you have to be a Jehovah's Witness to join? And the, and the guy's like, no, 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 there's no H. Read that again. I'm like, oh, it's Jehovah. Sign me up. And I'm so glad I did, because these guys are great. Go to the next slide. That is us. Some of us. There's roughly 50 of us. But this is, for the most part, the majority of the seven other people I play with. Starting on the far left, that really, really little guy who's really only about that tall, his name is Lynx. And I told him I was taking pictures, and he specifically said, what's up, group? So Lynx says hi, apparently. Standing next to him, we have Faust. Then we have Capri. Then we have myself in the center with the green jacket. Then we have Maharu, Sir McLean, and Rhiannon. They were kind enough to get together last night to finally get these pictures done because nobody believed their character would be used in a church service. And there's more pictures. A full party, as I said, is comprised of eight people. And their specific role these people need to be two tanks, two healers, four DPS. I'll get into that in a second. When the groups start getting together, you have specific jobs you need to fulfill. And these jobs in the game started making me think of what your role should be in the church. Bam, connection, right there. Just hang on with me, we're going someplace. I promise we're going someplace cool. So starting off, you can go to the next slide probably actually see what we're doing. <laughs> they wanted to pull their weapons out because they glow. And it looks pretty. Next slide. The first class you have is called a tank class. Now what this tank class does is they're the ones that take all the damage. Now in these games you have monsters attacking and the tanks are the ones that take the attacks. As you can see, they're wearing heavy armor, they look like knights, they got the big weapons, they got everything. You know what I mean? These are your middle-aged knight people. Now to me, what this means as far as what it should be for the church, these are your deep theological thinkers. And you all can think of somebody who's your friend, who's a very, very heavy base. Like I mentioned, that one guy from earlier, he'd be considered a theology tank. They're annoying sometimes, but they're a necessity. Right now in the seminary, I can immediately think of two people who are my theological tanks. Alex and Jeff. These guys, we will have these huge, deep theological conversations in a matter of minutes. They're the ones that can just mess you up for the rest of your life because they just told you something you never looked at before. I remember there was one day I was sitting in here after class, and it was me and Jason, who's no longer here at the seminary. And we were talking about Jesus. Great topic. And it started from, Jesus didn't exist until he was born. What? The incarnated being known as Jesus was not called Jesus in the beginning. He was something else. And then before that, they were, you know what I mean? Read your Ellen White, read your, read your Daniel, read your Genesis, read anything else. The word Jesus did not come up in the Old Testament. 
Jesus did not exist until Jesus was born into Jesus. Technically, it sounds heretical because this is way out of context, but what followed next was a half-hour conversation, totally changed the way I ever thought about Jesus and how even cooler he is than he was beforehand. These are the people that you need in your life. These are the people that need to be part of the group that can hammer down the theology, that can hammer down randomness and make it real to you. And this is what they look like to me. When I think of theological things, I think of people that are decked out in armor, got scribblings of the Bible all over them, and they're ready to go. They are ready to fight your hard uphill battle with you. And it's a wonderful thing to have these people in your life. They're just boss if anybody talks like me. Next slide. The joke behind this picture is everybody had this class, and it was hysterical. This is the healing class. So we all lined up for these pictures, and I'm like, okay, I need pictures of healers. Everybody switched at the same time. All their clothing, everything changed, and there's like a healer shortage at some times. And I'm like, really? You're all healers, but I can't find a healer when I need to do something? I'll rant about that later. So the healer class is exactly what it sounds like. This is the class that keeps you alive. Your character gets injured, you get a healing spell. Your character's dead, they resurrect you. Not in a heretical sense. They are to keep you alive in the game. Two of them in a party. Now what these people do is, is what Kemily was to me when I first started becoming a Christian. This was the person I called at two in the morning, three in the morning, four in the morning, crying, freaking out about my life, emotionally broken, heavily distraught spiritually. What really made me convert to Adventism is I really wanted to kill myself. And I just called her and I said, I don't know what to do. I am done. Well, we haven't seen each other in a couple months. Why don't you come and visit me? I'm in the Bible camp in Northern Michigan. Hey, now I'm in the seminary. These people are those that you go to and that you trust with your emotional problems, when your heart is broken, when you just don't know what to do with yourself anymore. You're not facing necessarily the big issue of theology. You're dealing with the self-issue of what the heck am I doing with my life? I got two friends that are healers for me. Keith is one of them. I've complained to him. I've cried in front of him. And he's brought me back together. I don't know why. He's glutton for punishment, apparently. Air high five for you, buddy. Psh. That's one of my healers. My other healer, up in Grand Rapids. Adrian. Go figure. You can talk about deep stuff with them, but it doesn't necessarily feel right. Like, I just can't walk up to one of you guys and start spouting off a bunch of stuff because that's not who you are. And we all have those one friends that are, they're friends, but they're not that class of friend. There's nothing wrong with that. Next slide. DPS class. Now, what this means, DPS, is damage per second. And how that works is they're the ones that keep attacking and damaging over and over and over. And, that, and it's so hard because you guys don't play video games. Anyways, so this is the DPS class. I'm standing in the middle because I'm awesome at it. It's my job. I love playing this job. Now these are the people that I started thinking about it. Okay, DPS doesn't take the damage. They'll die. They're basically like sorcerers, if you will. You know, Merlin. Does Merlin wear a suit of armor? No. But what they do is they're the ones that are consistently there for you. And you can talk to them. Just about kind of the random stuff and somehow tie God into it. You don't go to these people to handle your big theological problems. You go to these people to handle the everyday problems. You don't go to these people when you're crying and you're brokenhearted and you're giving up on your life. You go to these people... When you, want to find the, when you want to talk about where I can find God at the gym, where I can find God in the car, where I can find God on a motorcycle. These are the people you go to. These are the everyday contacts. There's four of these in a party. And in your life, they're probably one of the most abundant friends that you have. They're the ones that you laugh with out in the commons, that you make fun of at work, that makes fun of you at work. Ben's my boss. One, two, three. Jameson, Dale, Brandon. Three people I talk to on a daily basis about dumb stuff. 
dumb stuff. And God's there with it. And we can always tie it back to the church. We can always tie it back to what we need to do. I don't think there's another one. Go ahead. Slide. Okay. Go to the next slide, then. There you go. It's bookended, guys, so I don't leave that image up on the screen. <laughs> this next section I have titled is called Screwing Up. Now, I'm not saying that these party formations are static layouts in everybody's life. This is an overall template of what you should have to be well-rounded. Is anybody familiar with the Lord's Prayer? Do you know how it starts? Matthew 6, 9. Pray like this. Like this. Pray like this. Did Jesus say pray these words? Then why do we pray these words? I have nothing against it. I used to say it all the time. But he said pray like this. This is a template. What's it a template for? Hit all the points of what you should do in a prayer. Thank God for who he is. Thank God for what he's done. Thank God for forgiving your sins. Give him the grace to help you forgive other people's sins. Right? It's a template. That's a wonderful basic prayer. Now, if you, if you were to go back over the last slides, you can see that. You probably can see it. But you would notice that there were certain people fulfilling multiple roles. And at that point, it really hit me. We are all something to somebody else. When I play these games, I get asked questions. More recently, Final Fantasy XIII Lightning's Return came out, and somebody had, do you have a problem with her being called Savior in the game? So, no. In the contextualized story of what the game is, she is the Savior. It's a title. It's a generic phrase. It's not a problem for me. Somebody else is going to freak out about it. And that little guy on the end, that I said it was Lynx, he says, hi, everybody. He told me, if people were like me in the church, I gave him hope. I cringed. So I'm like, I am messed up. I am so happy the church isn't full of people like me. My other friends said the same thing. And they go to me to be their theological tanks. To hammer it down for them. To make it real to them. Other people come to me when they're crying and when they're broken. Other people come to me when they want to be dumb in the comments and just spitball stupid ideas. One of my favorite stupid ideas was Batman's a modern contemporary for Christ. Superman's a devil. I preached one of those. Guess which one? Oh, man, I'm right at the conclusion of this. Mercy. As we continue on our Christian walk, we are more than just party members in a group. Now, I realize this is a video game, and that's not real, unfortunately, because I would have this little birdie I could jump on and ride around. It would be fantastic. We're family members. All of us. You all came here. I know why most of you are here. Some of you, I don't know why you're here. I think because I paid you to take pictures, and he's paid to do his job up there, and I asked him to help me out. So the majority of us are here because we like God, hopefully. We're family, right? Aren't Christians family members? And even in that, we belong to a bigger body of believers, of people to help out, of things we can grab to form our eight-party formations and go deal with the theological issues of this church. Ephesians 4, 16. From him, the whole body, fitted and knitted together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself and love by the proper working of each individual part. Should I read it again? You guys just look like no one talked. For him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by proper working of each individual part. All body parts are different. We are all different. We all have different jobs. We all have different classes. We all have different roles. 
This is not a typical altar call. I do not preach typical sermons to have an altar call of give your life to Christ. Because I know you guys have given your life to Christ. You wouldn't be here in the first place. It's Saturday night, go out and party. But you're here, so obviously you like Jesus. So, who wants to be better? Who wants to be part of an active, functioning team a body that is to, to lift, support, heal, and take the burdens of one another. I pray all the time, God, don't let me screw up. Please don't let me screw up. People look to me for some stupid reason to be this, this role model. Don't let me screw up. Give me the grace to continue moving forward. Please give me the grace to continue moving forward. We have amazing opportunities to be friends to one another. And we have an amazing friend in God who is going to be there to help us be friends with each other. I bet if you guys met me on the street, you'd probably want to punch me in the throat. Sometimes I listen to what I say, I want to punch myself in the throat. But then I just can't stop talking. That's where I eh, type the sermon out because I can't stop. Let me turn this off. <clears throat> That's about all I have for that. You guys want to be part of a family, part of a body, part of a team to get together and help people? Do you want God to help you with that? It's hard. One of my newest friends here, sitting behind the seminary diva. Yeah, really, I went there. And she's a friend. I asked her for advice. I asked her for help. It turned out fabulous, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, good looking out. New friend, new DPS class for me. I walk into the gym, I hate myself, I hate the way I look. And she said something to me one day that just <clears throat> blew my mind away. You're here, that's all that matters. What is that? Do you want to affect somebody like that? I do. Let's pray. You guys can stand and pray if you want. You should stand and pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for...